what I'm gonna do is talk to you about uh, what happened in New York over the past six years, uh, some of the lessons that we learned and some of the bumps that we got uh, along the way. So before I get started, I wanna get a sense of the room. How many people have been to New York City? Huh. Great, how many people have been in the last five years? <laughs> how many of you came and rode bicycles? Okay. How many of you have not been to New York? Excellent. Well, to all of you, you have an official invitation to come. <laughs> so, New York City streets uh, over the last several years have seen dramatic change. And our mean streets have actually had an extreme makeover. Uh, and it's a new day in New York. And in fact, today, uh, it's a big day. And we're 13 and a half hours, I think, in front of New York. Uh, so we will be the first ones to say happy birthday uh, to the City Bike Program, which actually launched on May 27th, uh, 2013. So happy birthday. <laughs> and people have taken almost 9 million trips. They have ridden over 15 million miles, uh, which is the equivalent of some 600 times uh, around the earth. And I think that the fact that you've asked a New Yorker, actually two New Yorkers, uh, to speak at the world's premier cycling conference uh, says a lot about how far we've come, along with many other cities. So over the last six years, we've showed that when you build it, when you stripe it, when you paint it, uh, when you provide choices to people uh, in getting around, people will vote with their pedals, they will vote with their seats, with their transit passes, uh, with their bike share keys. And I think just a few years ago, when people thought about city biking, uh, I think images of Copenhagen really came to mind. Uh, or perhaps Amsterdam's famous bike parking lots. Or maybe Beijing's bicycle highways back in the days when it was known as the kingdom of bikes. Uh, but today, bikes, bike share, bike lanes, our basic infrastructure uh, in many of the cities around the world, from Kyoto, Japan, to cycle tracks in Turkey, bike lanes in Tel Aviv, uh, to a world-class uh, biking facility in Indianapolis. So how did we get here uh, after a century of car dominance? Uh, why is it that we're seeing a change in global support for bike infrastructure? I think at its core is the realization that we really can't build our way out of congestion. We are not gonna to get to where we need to go by triple decking our roads, and we won't create healthier cities, and we won't create safer neighborhoods with car-focused strategies. And our streets have taken on a much deeper importance uh, given the global challenges of population growth and climate change. More than half the world uh, lives in cities, and the UN estimates that over the next 40 years, that number is going to reach 70%. So the choices that we make today about how we prioritize our streets affects millions of people for generations to come. And it's clear in the United States that we're not gonna be driving our way into the 21st century the way we have been driving our way through the 20th. Even without a national transportation policy, the number of lane miles traveled over the last 20 years has fallen to its lowest levels, as you can see from the blue line there. And it's not just in the states. Similar trends are emerging in Australia and Japan and England and Germany and Norway. And younger people around the world want more transportation options, and they're the ones that are sparking the shared economy that we're just starting to glimpse today. Car share, bike share, Uber is now in 35 cities around the world. And planners really need to keep up with these changes and bring new approaches that adapt uh, to this new reality. Uh, cities, it's not just really about uh, transportation software. Uh, cities also have their legacy hardware. And whether it's New York or Adelaide, uh, or Sydney, or any other city, our streets have a lot in common. And the 20th century, really, the, those designs focused, uh, as was pointed out earlier, by moving cars as fast as possible from point A to point B, and it missed all the other ways that a street was used. 
This is Times Square in the 1950s. Uh, you can see it in Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn in the 1920s. And the approach was really epitomized in the 1939 World's Fair. This was the Futurama exhibit. Uh, fantastic, just fantastic. Can you see what's missing from this picture? Yeah, people. Um, you know, streets are a city's most valuable resource and they, the streets have not been designed for people at all. And somehow all this dysfunction has become a kind of accepted part of the streetscape. And we've become actually used to a street out of balance. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg's Plan YC changed all that. And while, you know, many mayoral administrations tend to think about things in four-year terms and business as usual, uh, he took the long view that we needed to make course corrections today to ensure that when we opened our door in 2030 with a million more New Yorkers, uh, we liked what we saw. And these course corrections got a lot of attention in New York City, particularly on the transportation front, uh, with new faster bus routes and bike lanes, uh, bike share, congestion pricing and plazas. And the strategies created uh, new choices uh, for people without a lot of money, uh, just by making better use of our existing infrastructure. So, with Plan YC in hand, we took a long, hard look at our streets and created designs that really did address the needs of all users. This is one of our first projects in Brooklyn. Uh, we took a parking lot under the Manhattan Bridge and turned it into a plaza that became a neighborhood centerpiece and an anchor for local businesses. In the three years since we implemented the project, uh, there was an increase in retail sales of 172%. And we just did it over a weekend just painted it, literally painted the city we wanted to see, threw in some tables and chairs and planters, and voila. Uh, probably the most famous example, uh, as Ethan uh, showed, is uh, the changes that we made to Times Square uh, in 2009, and we turned basically a motorway, a speedway, uh, into a pedestrian oasis that is now enjoyed by 350,000 pedestrians a day. And this was seen as the crossroads of the world. Right? But pedestrians apparently did not fit into this universe. Uh, and they really traded the safety of the sidewalk uh, for the street just to, just to get by. You know, we New Yorkers, we like to do things in a New York minute. We like to move fast. And so, you know, nothing would be more frustrating than you get to Times Square and, you know, there are four pedestrians right across, visitors usually, uh, and they're looking up and they're enjoying the sights, and like it drives us all mad, you know? We actually start to vibrate. Um, it gets that bad. Uh, I remember actually when I was commissioner, uh, there was a group of guerrilla artists, and they went to um, Fifth Avenue, and they dressed up as DOT workers, the hats, the vests, the whole bit, and they began to paint the sidewalk, uh, put a big line down the sidewalk on Fifth Avenue, and on one side, they wrote visitors, and the other side, they wrote New Yorkers. <laughs> and the thing was, everybody followed it. <laughs> and they thought it was a great uh, innovation. So uh, Times Square had 90% of the space was dedicated to uh, cars and 10% uh, to people. So we changed all that uh, using inexpensive materials. We tipped the balance in favor of uh, pedestrians overnight. We took the same approach to intersections all along Broadway. Um, this is Union Square before and after, and we delivered economic benefits, safety benefits, quality of life benefits uh, in close to real time. And you can see these plazas all over town. Uh, we've got over 60 of them uh, in planning or development, uh, and each one of them is maintained and requested uh, by communities. And they're showing up in cities all across the country. Uh, this is LA. Uh, in Mexico City, in the Zocalo. Um, and we've also brought a new approach to our streets. This looks like, a, you know, kind of an air, airport tarmac. Um, and it's a street in the Bronx. And we turned it into a dedicated uh, select bus service route. You know, literally painted a red, a red carpet for buses, uh, put in transit signal prioritization to give buses the green light and hold it longer. People paid before they got on the bus and we ticketed cars that got into the lane uh, using cameras. Uh, and you know, the result is much happy, 
much happier uh, customers. Actually, we did a survey and we found that 98% of riders uh, were extremely satisfied with the service. I mean, that's just unbelievable because 98% of New Yorkers don't agree on anything. So that was really uh, a good uh, indication for us. And, you know, it's a it's really important point because, you know, N New York City, we've got the largest bus fleet in North America and the slowest bus speeds. You know, as my chief engineer used to say, you can walk across town faster uh, than taking the bus. In fact, he also believes that the only way to get across town is to be born there. <laughs> so in six years, we tried to address that. We built six new select bus service lanes uh, in six years, benefiting 220,000 people a day. Big demand for more. Uh, and it's no longer just, you know, Curitiba and Bogota that have BRT. Cities like Cleveland, Lagos, Jakarta, and Brisbane are all investing in BRT, uh, along with 168 other cities. Uh, safer streets were probably one of the biggest benefits of these projects. We, we, in almost all of our projects, we put down pedestrian islands, uh, delineated the lanes, made clear lanes, put in curb extensions. Uh, here is a, a project that we did at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge where all of this tsunami uh, came together. You had this clash of uh, pedestrians and bikes and trucks and cars, sometimes with deadly consequences. Seven people died, uh, nine people died in seven years and we just shortened the crossing distance and, and gave pedestrians more uh, light, time to cross, uh, added 1,900 meters of pedestrian space without spending millions of dollars and without taking decades to do so. So, and we're seeing this work uh, and these techniques being used in cities like Buenos Aires, uh, in uh, San Francisco, uh, and it's been great, but nothing nothing has captured the imagination of New Yorkers and people around the world uh, in quite the same way as bikes. Uh, bikes, bike lanes, bike corrals, bike share. Uh, and in less than seven years, we built almost 400 miles uh, of on-street bike lanes. And we really created a true uh, biking backbone, you know, connecting to the key uh, bridges and the destinations pe where people really wanted to go. So this was the map in 2007. But what this map does not show is the variety of techniques that we brought to the streets that were tailored to meet the needs and the demands of each street. So we took, oops, I can't go forward here. Um, we took a wide uh, street uh, on 8th Avenue and put in a uh, parking protected uh, bike lane. We turned a chaotic street uh, in New York that really said, you know, bike at your own risk uh, and turned it into a pedestrian and car safe corridor. Uh, and this is the first protected, uh, parking protected bike lane in the United States on 9th Avenue. And on streets with enough room for a buffer, uh, that didn't have enough room for a buffer, we put down uh, high visibility uh, green lines and with green paint and in places where we did have room we put in buffered bike lanes. Um, we also installed two-way um, lanes uh, and used local artists to help beautify uh, the barriers to create a more attractive uh, trip. And you know it was interesting along the way uh, there were, uh, oh, we put the bike boxes in uh, and uh, we did this all over town, uh, and I think it really signaled a new era in road uh, design in New York City, um, and it really prioritized our vulnerable, most vulnerable pedestrians, which were uh, children and kids. So, you know, we create these safer streets. It's, it's um, great for everyone, right? Uh, not so much. Uh, this is what the newspaper started to do. You know, we, we did this great work, uh, and the newspapers called this bike lash. Uh, and fear of bike lash, battle of the bike lanes, uh, everything you could imagine. And the changes were discussed only in terms of how they created conflict among the few and not in terms of the benefits that they created uh, for everybody. You know, it was so interesting because some people said um, that so many people would bike uh, that they would put everybody in danger. Uh, and other people said, that they should be removed because nobody used them. Uh, some said that uh, nobody asked for them, uh, even though communities all across the city 
uh, had requested them. You know, we heard every argument about why the bike lanes wouldn't work, couldn't work. Uh, how about this one? What if the man was on the bike was a terrorist? <laughs> this is a true story. It was, it was completely surreal, uh, completely surreal. You know, we, we, were, we were in the position of defending actions uh, that made dangerous streets safer. Uh, you'd think we'd have to defend uh, against, you know, keeping things in their current dangerous state. Um, one Brooklyn paper got so worked up that they called the Prospect Park bike lane, what you see right here, the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip. <laughs> this is it, you know, we created a two-way bike lane uh, connected to the park and nearby neighborhoods and we reduced speeding. It didn't uh, impact traffic volumes, um, but it did not stop the yelling. A small group of residents uh, were very worked up, uh, but the overwhelming uh, majority of the community supported it and uh, the counter protests far outnumbered uh, the opponents of the lane. And I really can't say enough for the work of the advocates here. Uh, transportation Alternatives, Streets Blog, the community board leaders like Eric McCure, uh, McClure, who came out time and time again to defend uh, these new uh, approaches and uh, did it uh, in really important ways in really, at really important times. Uh, for the record, the bike lane is still there. The protesters, not so much. Um, and while there were you know, short-term headlines, uh, there were long-term benefits and there was the data. Uh, and when the data came in, it made a huge difference. Bike ridership doubled on week ends and it tripled on weekdays. The number of cars speeding dropped by 75% and cyclists were no longer uh, riding on the sidewalk. Children and families were out biking uh, and polls showed wide support uh, for the Prospect Park bike lane uh, and uh, for bike lanes elsewhere in the city. So in the end, the reality just wasn't the sum of the headlines. And for all of the headlines that you may have read, <laughs> uh, our investment in bike and pedestrian infrastructure was less than 1% of our state of good repair spending uh, on roads and bridges. And yet it was 99% uh, of our press coverage. <laughs> A lot of the reaction to these kinds of changes aren't uh, unique to New York. Uh, you can see that in London and Toronto and Chicago, uh, San Francisco uh, and in Vancouver and Calgary and LA, uh, the transition to more livable streets can be painful. Uh, people are naturally attracted to their streets and they are leery of a government that says, hey, we're here to help. Um, and there seems to be a tension about changes that come at the cost of the automobile. And some of it is cultural and some of it is political. Taking on bikes might seem like good politics to some, and it's really easy to throw up your hands and say, you know, your city isn't ready to make the change needed to get to a more livable future. I think this is a pretty stunning quote from uh, Toronto Mayor Rob Forb. Uh, and although it turned out that bike lanes were the least of his problems, <laughs> Uh, a lot of people shared that sentiment. We had our own version of this in New York. Uh, <laughs> not, this is my really kind of revenge moment. Um, not being safe or ready for biking is kind of viewed as with this sort of sense of pride. Um, but New Yorkers were ready. And we brought 6,000 uh, bikes and 330 stations uh, to the streets of New York. We had a $47 million uh, sponsorship package from Citibank and MasterCard so that it was at no cost to taxpayers. Um, and you know, despite some of the press uh, and some of the lawsuits and some of the concerns uh, that the bikes were too heavy, the bikes were too blue, <laughs> the bike racks slowed ambulances, or that homeless people were using them for pickup spin classes, That's my favorite. That's really my favorite. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, City Bike seems to touch a particular segment of New Yorkers that uh, have an aversion to anything suggested by Mayor Bloomberg, anything environmental, or that involves sharing, uh, or is in any way healthy or vaguely French. <laughs> I think this Venn diagram sort of ties it all together. Uh, and an editorial board member of the Wall Street Journal famously introduced the word begrimed into the transportation lexicon. She said the racks were an eyesore and that the powerful, all-powerful bike lobby in New York uh, was being given free reign by the mayor. Um, even John Stewart and Stephen Colbert got into it. But the biggest concern that we heard time and time again was about safety. Uh, and even before City Bike launched, there was a researcher who predicted that without a helmet requirement for bike share, uh, bike casualties might triple. But the reality is that more bikes mean safer streets. All bike deaths dropped by a third. No pedestrians were killed by bike raiders last year or in the last five years. And this outcome was years in the making. We built the network, we gave away 100,000 free helmets, we launched safety education campaigns, and you can see the result. You know, that maximum safety in numbers is actually true. More cyclists, more bike lanes, uh, and you don't see any increase in injuries. Yeah. And we've had a banner year. Riders, as I mentioned, have biked over 15 million miles. And in the process, you know, I worked for a data-driven mayor. Um, they have burned off the equivalent of one million Big Macs, 600,000 pints of Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia ice cream, or perhaps closer to home, 7.1 million Tim Tams. So uh, the numbers are really uh, important, as, as uh, really important to my mayor, as he likes to say, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. So we worked hard to measure the impact of our projects uh, before and three years after implementation. And we found that streets with protected bike lanes saw injuries to all users go down 50%. And we saw retail sales on bike lanes like 9th Avenue with that protected bike lane. Uh, retail sales increased uh, 49%. Uh, and it's clear that good streets are safer streets uh, and they're good for business. Uh, we also uh, found data from Times Square uh, to the point about traffic. Where does that traffic go? Uh, so in the five years since we implemented all of the projects uh, around the Central Business District in Times Square, all the bike lanes, the pedestrian mobility projects, uh, all that work, closing Times Square to cars, traffic uh, actually got better. Uh, so, you know, it's not a zero-sum game between uh, traffic and public space. Uh, we also found uh, that there's less speeding and more spending. Uh, there's less delay for buses uh, and more retail sales along uh, select bus service corridors. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, numbers were really great in terms of what happened to the CBD. Uh, and, uh, you know, not everybody wanted to believe it. We actually have uh, GPS devices in all 13,000 yellow cabs. Uh, so we were able to actually track uh, what the numbers were uh, with that data. And while it may not seem obvious, while it may seem pretty obvious that, you know, more pedestrians and more bikes is good for the environment, uh, we saw pretty dramatic results quickly. Uh, when we closed Times Square, there was a 41% decrease in greenhouse gas emissions uh, after we implemented the changes. So we documented all of these changes in a report uh, that we released last fall, which has been really important for other cities uh, that uh, are looking to this kind of data to use in analyzing their own projects. And it's all available on uh, our website, uh, on the DOT website, uh, nyc.gov uh, uh, slash DOT. This seems to have disappeared already from my brain. Um, so the conversation uh, graduated from quickly from uh, anecdote to analysis. And when we talked about bikes in terms of transportation choices, in terms of safety, in terms of economic development, uh, they responded. You know, New York is a city of 8.4 million people. And uh, I think it's got 9.4 million uh, opinions. 
And if you try to get a consensus, 100% uh, consensus, you will not wind up uh, doing anything. Um, and you're gonna end up with the same kind of uh, inaction that led to the kind of suspended animation that we saw on New York City streets for so long. And when New Yorkers were asked uh, what they thought, the answer was the same, they loved it. Uh, in the last poll before Mayor Bloomberg left office, 73% said that they supported bike share, 72% uh, supported the plazas, 64% supported the bike lanes. It's clear that people were ahead of the press, people were ahead of the politicians. Uh, you can also see the changes in who's biking. Uh, in a few short years, we've gone from the kind of Mad Max road warrior uh, to uh, more uh, daily commuters. And we've seen a similar change in the media coverage. Uh, these streets work for everyone, uh, not just bike riders. And given a choice, people want safer, uh, more livable streets. And it's not an easy change but we found that good outcomes will outlast bad headlines. And space for pedestrians, uh, space for buses, space for bikes shouldn't be merely what's left over uh, after space for cars has been carved out. It should be designed into our streets from the very beginning. This is what uh, First Avenue looks like today. I remember uh, just a year ago when I was riding up First Avenue, uh, on the day that City Bike launched and everything was in its place, the bikes were in their protective bike lanes and the heads were on the uh, islands and the traffic was flowing and the buses were moving and the birds were singing and the trees were swaying and I think there was a rainbow. Um, and it wasn't so long that it looked like this. And something as simple as a bike lane can transform a city and city by city, we can transform the world. And it doesn't need to take decades, and it doesn't need to take millions. It takes vision, it takes political courage, it takes advocacy, it takes the passion and energy of everyone in this room. Thank you.